Okay, the sun is setting. Story time. Tonight, spooky, creepy, disturbing, and uh, just plain terrible. So if you're easily triggered or have nightmares, don't blame me. Hey guys, ML Behrman here with another episode of Mojave Mysteries, Mini Mysteries, which are small stories that didn't quite rate their own episode, but are great nonetheless. Now, uh, before we get started, I just want to give a shout out to two viewers. Now, you may notice that YouTube now has started putting under the viewer a little dollar sign, and that's a thing you can donate to your favorite creator to help support the channel. And last Mini Mysteries episode, two viewers, Tony Hernandez and YouTubes donated. So guys, you bought the booze tonight and tonight we're having coffee and fireball whiskey. Whiskey because it plays a factor in two of our stories. Well, maybe three. Anyway, let's, I'm gonna jump in the truck and we'll get started. All right, our first story comes from the desert near Blythe, California in the year 1969. Now, 1969 was a very tumultuous year in American history. The Vietnam War was going on. There were protests, assassinations. The FBI and the CIA had been investigating American domestic groups, everything from the Black Panthers to Martin Luther King to John Lennon and cults. And at that time, Charles Manson and his family were running their little murder cult up in Death Valley, which in the Mojave is north of where our story happens. And our story happens in the southern Mojave, where a cult was operating that a lot of people don't know about today. And the cult was called the Ordi Templar Orientalis, or OTO for short. And what it was is it had been founded in London in 1895 by a real twisted individual, this guy, Alistair Crowley. Now, Crowley at one time was called the wickedest man alive, and his lodge or, or cult centered around sex magic, which was his... Uh, term for different ceremonies that involve sex and bodily fluids that would give you uh, access to dark powers or whatever. Um, really, to me, I mean, I got to say it was a bunch of mumbo jumbo excuse to get your freak on, but whatever. So that's where the OTO started. Now, when he died in the 1940s, it had pretty much died out, except a follower of his or a follower of the temple, a woman named Jean uh, Brayton, born in London, came to the American desert and started her own version of the cult. And she called her lodge the Solar Lodge, and their compound they called the Ark, which was a name for basically what was a glorified um, goat farm. They raised goats and horses and did all sorts of weird ceremonies that had raised rumors, but people didn't really know what was going on out there. And she had gathered a bunch of uh, followers around her, and they had their little OTO cult going. Now, she was described as a Satanist who believed that black and brown people were inferior and there needed to be a race war in order to even things out, which is basically the same garbage that Charlie Manson was spouting with his Helter Skelter and, and his uh, crap. Now, excuse me, there were rumors that he had been seen down at her cult in the southern part of the desert and that they were kind of bumping heads on stuff. Uh, rumors, I don't know. This story has so many different versions. I'm going to try and give you as easily condensed version as I can. And anyway, uh, she was running this cult, and the people near Blythe didn't know what was going on out there, but they had suspicions that it wasn't good. Now, what happened next? There's three versions. One, that the FBI had an informant inside the cult, and that he tipped off the police as to what was going on. The 
other version is that uh, it was just one of the cult members got sick of what was happening and he tipped them off. And that's what the Riverside police who ultimately prosecuted the case said was the deal. And the third was that uh, some locals had gone out there to purchase some livestock, specifically a couple horses. And while they were out there, they saw a little boy chained in a box, six by six foot crate, out in that blazing sun. He was covered with sores, dirty, chained, um, no food or water, or at least rotten food and, and very little water around him. And he seemed out of it, obviously. And um, he said the smell was really bad. So they came back and told the Riverside Police Department, which is the county that it was in, I guess, uh, what was going on or what they had seen. And the police department raided the farm. And when they raided it, they indeed found the little boy chained up in this box and they arrested like 11 people that they could find. But two people got away. One was the leader, this lady, Mrs. Brayton, and the other turned out to be the child's own mother, a, na a lady named Mrs. Gibbons. The child's name was Anthony Saul Gibbons, and the Gibbons family, I guess, were followers of this lady, and um, this was her son. Now, the story that the informant gave to the police was that this little boy had accidentally or had set one of the buildings on fire and it had burned down and killed a couple of the goats, livestock. So Mrs. Brayton called everyone together in the cult and had a meeting about what to do with the little boy. And if you want to talk about a monstrous happening, supposedly his own mother said the little boy should be executed. He should be put to death for doing this horrible thing. And this Mrs. Brayton, the leader, said, no, what we're going to do is we're going to chain him up. We're going to torture him and punish him as an example to the others of, you know, to toe the line or behave or whatever. And so they did. And supposedly they kept him in this box for 56 days. And they only let him out to torture him, to burn him with matches, to make him dig graves, to do mock, mock executions of him, and they dosed him with LSD at the whole time. Now, when the paper got a hold of this, immediately, you know, it had to be sensationalized, and their story was this. Box boy, right? The commune or mysterious cult had tortured this little boy and kept him in a box, and they named him Box Boy. And they had a trial with who they could get their hands on were these other members. And uh, as the trial went on, they were able, the child was in such bad shape, they had to nurse him back to help before he could even testify. And eventually he did testify, right? Box boy tells all. And in it, the little boy said he had been playing with matches. Now he was six years old and he accidentally set the shed on fire, and it did burn down. And that, again, they had decided to torture him as an example to the rest of the cult members of what not to do. And the only picture I could find of him was this really bad copy here. And that pictures the little boy there, you see him. And the caption of the article said that that girl is his sister. Now, I didn't read anything in any of the articles about other family members being there and nothing about a dad, just that his mom, this Mrs. Gibbons, a follower of Mrs. Brayton, was one of the instigators and she would come and go as he was being tortured. Like, imagine your child out there and this is what's going on and you, you don't even care. Uh, they sentenced nine of them to uh, terms in jail for felony child abuse, but they couldn't get Mrs. Brayton because apparently she and her husband skipped town and went to Mexico and were hiding out. And this Mrs. Gibbons went back to LA and I never was able to find what, if they were able to get her. 
Now, what's the epilogue of this? Well, this is the most shocking part. They tracked her down in Mexico, and they had to uh, do a deal with her to get her to surrender so they could bring her back to America and put her on trial. And that's what they did. She gave herself up, came back. She's put on trial. Now get a load of this. She was sentenced to three years probation and a $500 fine. That's all. Now you're probably going, what the hell? Why was this allowed? Well, apparently there was some legal things about they might have used, quote, entrapment to catch her down in Mexico, and that played on the legality of the hearing. So, 1969, the box boy, Mrs. Brayton, this crazy cult, and this was the result. Three years probation and a $500 fine. Now, the little boy, they took him away, obviously, from the family, and he went into foster care, and I don't know what happened to him. If you Google this on uh, Google, you will get some different variations of the story, but that's pretty much it. Uh, there's a wiki page on it that details some of it. And I didn't see anyone that had all these articles that I found, but I'm sure they're out there. If I can find them, anyone can. But the boy in the box, that's our first story. And you got to admit, that's pretty horrible. Our next story comes from Yuma, Arizona in 1951. And this is a classic desert missing person story. Classic in the sense that it's got so much weirdness about it that, uh, well, I'll tell it and you tell me what you think happened. In 1951, a couple in their 20s, uh, Klaus Martins and June Palmer, rented a plane from Blythe, believe it or not, and were flying to Arizona. And they disappeared, or at least the plane disappeared. There was no report. They never made wherever they were supposed to go. And a search was mounted. They started looking in the desert and out in an open spot near Yuma, which there's a lot of open spot out there. Uh, they found the plane and it was abandoned. It had been landed in the desert and left. Now, there were some curious things. There was a note pinned to the seat that said, we are walking west. And that was it. And also on the seat was a compass. Now, you think if you're going to go walking, you take your compass. The footsteps, or there were a trail of footsteps leading from the plane, were followed. And they led for three miles where suddenly they stopped. And no trace of the couple, no trace of other uh, footprints or anything. Excuse me. Now, of course, that in itself is really weird. But once they started investigating it, there were more things. And the case became known as the missing couple. Now, what were the other weird things about the case? Well, when they started looking... The plane had been rented, and so they brought the guy out who they rented the plane from, who owned it, and he was able to start it right up. There was no engine trouble. It had gas. The radio was working. Why, you know, if you had to make an emergency landing, why wouldn't you call for help with a working radio? Uh, the sheriff who followed the trail said there was one weird thing about it. Well, a couple weird things was that there was nothing along the trail that would indicate people wandering. He says, usually when you're following missing people, you'll find like a gum wrapper here or a piece of clothing thrown down here or they stopped and made a fire or they sat down here or whatever. He said there was nothing. It was like they had a goal where they were going. The other thing was that the trail crossed a road. And if you had stayed on that road or followed it, you would have made it back to civilization or at least uh, encountered a car or a truck or something for help. But he said the trail went straight across the road out into the desert. And the thing was, if you had been flying over that area, you would see that if you walked west from where the plane was landed, it would be even more remote and forbidding. 
So why would you go that direction? Why would you skip the road? Whatever. And so, of course, all these theories started popping up. They started looking at the couple. Well, turns out she was a dental assistant and, and uh, he was a uh, young guy that was working in aerospace and other things. But they found out that his dad had been an ex-Nazi bigwig during the war. Remember, this is 1941. And was now a big communist uh, member in East Germany. Because at the time, Germany was partitioned. You know, the eastern half was communist. So they figured, well, some people figured, oh, there must have been some skullduggery where he was, you know, going over to the commies. And they arranged this thing where he'd be picked up in the desert and get a whole new life and do you know, whatever nefarious activities he was going to do. And they had, someone put out the report that there had been plane tracks near where the their tracks had stopped and that the sheriff said it looked like a plane had landed and picked them up. Now the sheriff said, came back and said, no, I didn't say that. There were no tracks. Uh, he goes, at most there might have been a rainstorm or something that erased the rest of the tracks, but I saw no car tracks, no plane landing tracks, nothing, no, nothing to indicate that they had done anything other than walked into the desert and all of a sudden disappeared. And they have never been heard from since. There's been more theories like, uh, he was actually working for the CIA and he decided to go undercover and that this was a way to disappear and make it look like it was natural. Now that is an indication of thinking that doesn't quite follow what covert activity is. Covert activity is supposed to be under the radar. If you're going to disappear, why do something like this where it's going to involve federal agencies searching for you? I mean, if you're going to try and disappear, you just go out the front door and catch a cab and off you go. I mean, come on, husbands do that all the time, right? Uh, so this case... I mean, it, it's it. This one is really mind bending in that why would they land that plane that was in good shape, working radio, take off in the desert, leave their compass, write this note that just says we're walking west, not why, where they're going, whatever. Because this happened in the fifties. I mean, if you're a fan of classic fifties horror and sci fi movies, this one it seems like it came right from some scriptwriter's brain because. You know, what happened? The UFO picked them up? or Now, one theory was that maybe they had come across drug smugglers or human smugglers, and they had been killed and put out of the way somewhere, which is entirely possible, because in that part of the desert along the border, there's a lot of shady stuff going on. Um, so anyway, that's it. The missing couple that disappeared after landing their plane for whatever reason. And I'd be curious what you guys think might have happened. Um, it's a strange one. Our next story comes from Vermont in 1882. And this one needs a little background uh, in that it involves a variation of stories that were popular along the frontier going back to the 1700s. And it involves large, hairy creatures. Specifically, large hairy creatures interbreeding with people. Now, we're talking about Bigfoot, right? Or wild men or wild women or whatever. Native American folklore that has a lot of these stories usually goes like this. A creature kidnaps a maiden who's out working or doing something in the field or woods and takes her off. And a year later, she's returned to the tribe and she's pregnant and she gives birth to a baby that's either horribly deformed or totally normal. But an interesting aspect of the stories is that she's almost always uh, can't remember what happened. All she remembers is getting snatched and that then she got returned. But what happened in between is almost like a missing time uh, story, like in a UFO abduction. Um, or very old fairy tales. It's interesting that that's their take on it, was that the male creature would take a female and uh, interbreed with her and bring her back, and she'd have this kid. 
And in some cases, the woman never recovered and she went mad or she killed herself or uh, in some, she ran off back to the woods, back to the creature, whatever. Now, let's do the flip side of that. The white version or white frontiersman version. And this was popular all through the, from east all the way to the west. And it usually went like this. A trapper or hunter was up in the mountains, a mountain man, someone who spends months, years on end up in the mountains. And winter was coming out and he needed to find a place to shelter. So he, he, one night during a huge storm, he finds a cave and he goes in and it's a big cave. He goes in deep and lights a match or uses a torch or something. And in the back of the cave, there's a large hairy creature cowering in the corner female, or at least somewhat female or looking female, but hairy all over and everything. And it's terrified of the guy and he's terrified of it, but he doesn't want to go back out in the storm. So he builds a fire out of twigs and whatever he can gather in the cave and puts it in between him and this creature that's cowering in the corner. And uh, the creature seems very scared of fire and won't come near. And that's what he's using the fire for. Now, in the stories, this goes on for a day, a couple days, and finally he's got to eat, right? So he decides to go out and try and find something to eat, and he, he uh, gets something, some meat, and he brings it back, and he starts cooking it. And the creature watches him, and she brings out some food, but it's like nuts and berries and twigs, and, you know, he he's scared that the meat is going to, like, attract the creature, but it doesn't. The creature's not interested in flesh. Um, but it starts coming closer to the fire over the next week or so that they're cohabiting up there because it's cold and it, it comes near the fire to warm itself. So the tale goes on that, that the, he spent the winter up there with this creature cohabiting in this cave and they got closer and closer. You know where this is going. Springtime arrives, and guess what? She's pregnant <laughs> and has a baby. And the baby is half white, half Bigfoot. And in certain stories, like it's like almost perfect, you know, like one half is hairy, one half is white, or it's like piebald, right? It's got patches of hair and then patches of white skin. And, and, and some it's, you know, the upper half is ape-like and, and Bigfoot, and the bottom half is white man-like and whatever. So our trapper has this woman and child. Well, spring is coming on. The ice is breaking up. The rivers are able to f navigate and the lakes. So he decides it's time to leave. And he loads his canoe and launches it on a lake. And all the time, this Bigfoot creature is holding the baby, watching him, you know, wondering what's going on. And he paddles out into the lake and starts off like, see, I had my fun. I'm out of here. Whereupon the creature starts howling, you know, pitiful and holding up the baby like, look, look, you know, and he's, you know, just keeps going. And suddenly the creature gets enraged and rips the baby in half and throws the white half at him and throws the other half down and turns and runs off into the woods. And he keeps going. And for years after, they can hear the Bigfoot creature up there sobbing or, or howling or, or crying. So that's, that's the folklore story. I mean, there's many variations of that uh, going back to Daniel Boone times in American frontier folklore. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm not going to comment other than, yeah. Okay. I don't know why if you interbred with some ape like thing, you'd be off bragging to your friends about it. But anyway, uh, that's that. Now, how does that bring us back to Vermont in 1882? Well, it does because the article, a wild woman in Vermont, and it details a very interesting experience that is slightly different than the interbreeding one I just told you. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read you the article because it's 
it's short, but it's, it's crazy. All right. Excuse me. I got to put on my, uh, cheap drugstore cheaters here. Okay. Here it is. A wild woman in Vermont. A Frenchman who recently visited Bear Swamp near Stamp Stamford, Vermont, on a hunting excursion, relates this story and furnishes partial proof of his statement in the scars which his face bears. After traveling about the woods in the vicinity of Bear Swamp with varying success for about half an hour, he was startled by a sudden noise in the thicket nearby and at once put his gun to his shoulder. But seeing a strange apparition, which at first sight he imagined was a bear, he started on a run for a tree. A wild, maniacal laugh followed him, and the black hairy creature disappeared, walking, as the man thought, on its hind legs. The noise emitted from the creature's lungs led the hunter to believe that it was something other than a bear, and mustering as much courage as his frightened condition would allow, he started to investigate. He had proceeded but a short distance into the depths of the brush and undergrowth when he caught sight of the black figure leaning over a spring, drinking with its back toward the hunter. The time had arrived for action, and throwing down his gun, the hunter rushed to the creature and clasped his arm around what proved to be the waist of a woman, nude except for a heavy growth of black hair that covered every portion of her body except a portion of her breasts. The hug was but temporary, however, for turning upon him, the strange creature pierced and tore the inquisitive hunter's face until he was glad to let go and run for his life. All right. There's a slightly different version of interbreeding with Bigfoot. Uh, this guy <laughs> said that... He sees this creature, and of course he decides to run out there and grab it from behind, which, okay. Uh, and it ripped him up, and he ran off. So, I, I don't know what to say other than last episode we had a wild man, and here's a nude wild woman for you. All right, let's keep the party going with our fourth story. And... Um, this is Sebastopol, California, in 1871. And before I tell you this story, I want to show you a picture so you can kind of understand what I'm talking about. And here it is. Yeah, that's the business end of a very large tarantula, which figures in our story. So, in 1871, a man named William Meeker decided to clean out some trash that was near the water barrel in his back garden. So he went out there and stuck his hands under the barrel to clean out some of the trash. Now, if you know anything about the desert, you never stick your hands, your feet, or your butt where you can't see what's down there. So anyway, he sticks his hand in there and starts pulling out some brush. And, of course, he feels something latch on to his finger of his right hand. And then he said he felt the most excruciating pain he's ever felt in his life as something pierced the finger and started injecting venom or something into him. And he jerked his hand out and clinging to his hand and finger was the biggest tarantula he had ever seen. And he said that it, he couldn't get it off, that it was clinging so hard that, uh, you know, he, he couldn't bash it off. So he hit, hit and finally it dropped off and ran off. Meanwhile, he said that he started to get pain and a weird feeling moving up his arm, right? Going up his arm to his shoulder, which is pretty indicative of uh, being poisoned, but more so anaphylactic shock because uh, tarantula bites, scorpion stings, bee stings, they all kind of are similar in that they can send people that are susceptible to that into bad shock. Now, this is 1871. You're not going to call 911. You're not going to jump in the car and go to the emergency room. You've got to deal with it. And he said that his 
arm started to swell up and he was having tremendous pain. So what to do? Well, God bless him. He went in the house and decided what he had to do was chug some whiskey. And he started doing that. He grabbed a bottle of old rock gut and started chugging. And he said that he downed three pints over the next hour, which is some good drinking, which caused him to pass out. And he was out all night. And when he woke up, he said, marvel of the ages. The pain was gone. The swelling was gone. There was nothing uh, wrong with his arm anymore. And reported it to the paper. And what did they say? Whiskey saves man poisoned by spider. So uh, if you're ever out and you get bit, maybe you should drink some whiskey. Uh, Now, I'm not saying that. I'm not giving you that advice, but it's been known to happen. And You might be asking, ML, how would you know? Well, let's uh, fill our glass, and I will return with a story that's not for the faint of heart. All right. Now, the biggest tarantula I've ever seen and interacted with, a few years ago, well, more like 10 years now, uh, some friends and I went out into the desert, spent the night during August, full moon, and we set up camp. We no roads, nothing. We had gone out in the back country, making our own road. We set up our jeeps and our cots. Uh, my best friend, his wife, and just me, and had a cookout and went to bed. Now I had told his wife, "You got to be careful when you're sleeping on a cot in the desert that you don't let the blanket fall onto the ground, because whatever crawls on that ground at night will crawl right up." that blanket into bed with you. And, you know, she listened, okay. So we go to sleep and I woke up around two o'clock, which I usually do. And and on a full moon night, I like to just lay there and watch stuff because in the desert full moon, you can see things so well. And I'm laying on my stomach, just kind of spacing out, looking at the uh, front of my Jeep, when all of a sudden I see come around the corner of the Jeep, the biggest tarantula I've ever seen. And August gets near tarantula mating season where the males go out at night and they're looking for females. So they investigate everything that they can find. And they're very inquisitive. I mean, if you set something down, they'll come over and look at it. And uh, anyway, this thing walks into camp and I watch him. Now I had been using a pair of flip-flops for camp shoes that night because I was four feet from the fire. It was sand, not gravel. I could see real well. And my flip-flops were down next to my cot on the ground. And you usually don't leave stuff on the ground because things crawl in it. But flip-flops, nothing's going to crawl in it. I watch as this huge tarantula comes over and he goes right to my flip-flops. And he's, he's tapping them with his feet or tappers, whatever those things are. And uh, checking it out. And then he goes over to where my friend's wife's sleeping and her blanket's on the ground. And he walks right over to the blanket and starts, I'm like, oh, I know it's gonna happen. So I get up and I break off a little twig from a nearby creosote bush and I just kind of shoo him away from it and try and head him out of camp. Now I got a video that I took that I'm gonna show you right now. All right, that's him, that's granddaddy and he's heading out of camp now You can see I pan down to my feet because you can see I'm wearing my flip-flops and back to him. And so he left, right? And in the morning I told her like, you wouldn't believe the size of the tarantula that came visiting last night and almost crawled up your blanket, like I said, but uh, that was it. The biggest tarantula. Now, the real story I'm gonna tell you tonight Five years ago was my birthday, which is in August. The same couple, my best friend and his wife, and my girlfriend and I go out into the desert to celebrate. Full moon night, going to be great. We go to one of our favorite spots, which is an abandoned mine out in the mining district near Joshua Tree, where there's a cement overlook of a little valley. You can camp up there and have a fire and there's a cement slab. So they were on the cement slab with their cots 
and I and my girlfriend were next to my Jeep on the gravel, the dirt, on this side of the fire. Now, my friends know that I'm partial to uh, fireball whiskey. So they had bought me a huge bottle for my birthday and, you know, started in on it. So by midnight, we're all feeling pretty good and decide to retire and, and go to bed. So everyone lays down on their cot. Now, that night, because I was on rough gravel and stuff, I knew there was stuff walking around, crawling around down there. So I was wearing tennis shoes uh, in camp rather than flip-flops. And I took my tennis shoes off when I got in my cot, and I put it up in the camp chair next to my cot, right? So it's off the ground. I go to sleep. Everyone goes to sleep. And again, I wake up around 2 o'clock. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm like, ah, you know, I got to pee really bad. So I get up. I grab my sneakers off the chair, and I clack them together, make sure nothing's in them anyhow, put them on. I go out, you know, 20 yards away, do my biz, come back. And I wasn't using a flashlight because of the, the moon was super bright. You could see really well. And I sit back down on my cot and I'm about to take my shoes off when all of a sudden I feel, it feels like someone took a cigarette and stuck it right against the instep of my left foot, like burning, like ow, 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 ow. And I look down and... Mind you, I'm crocked, it's moonlight, I don't have my flashlight, and I can see on the side of my white shoe what looks like the biggest spider I've ever seen clinging to it, where the pain's coming from. And I, uh, I'm like, what the hell is this thing, you know? And I find my flashlight and I turn it on the flashlight and it is the biggest scorpion I've ever seen. And he's got my whole shoe like this and he's got that stinger which that stinger right there through my shoe into my foot and man he's just pumping it he's like working that venom and i can feel it it's like ow 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 i'm like you little bastard so i stomped my foot a couple times to get i couldn't get him off just like that last story i told you i couldn't get this the tarantula off i couldn't get this scorpion off my foot and I stamp again, and he falls off, and he takes off. So what do I do? I grab my phone. I'm like, I got to get a shot of this. You know, this will be great for the channel. So I start chasing him through the desert, trying to get a video of him. Now I actually have it, and this is the video. All right, so I'm after him. You can see I finally cornered the little guy. He wasn't little. He was big. And the whole time I'm calling to my girlfriend, and I didn't include the sound of this so she, you wouldn't hear her, but I'm going, honey, wake up, babe, wake up. Look at this thing, man. This thing just stung me. I'm drunk, right? And uh, she's like, no, no, I don't want to get out. I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. I'm like, no, come on. Come look. He's huge. And I took his picture because he stopped. So I got a couple of pictures there and there. You can see he's a good size one. I mean, he's the biggest I've ever seen. And... Uh, you know, later I asked her, like, why didn't you get up and look at this scorpion that stung me? She's like, if I knew that those things were crawling around on the ground, I would never go out there again. And I would never, you know, want to go to the bathroom out there. Now, you say, well, did I stomp on him? Did I crush him? No, I didn't. And, you know, because it's his desert. I mean, we're visiting, he lives there, and it wasn't like he came out of the darkness and, and attacked me, right? He, what happened was he was probably under my cot, just sitting there. And when I walked back and put my foot down, he, I probably almost squished him. So he, you know, attacked to protect himself. And that's when he was uh, giving me a shot of scorpion juice. So, you know, I'm not going to kill him now. Uh, anaphylactic shock. My little sister, who passed away, she had she was allergic to bee stings, and and a sting like that would send her to the emergency room. My best friend, who was laying in the cot across the fire from me, same thing with him. If he got stung, he'd have to go to the emergency room. I've been stung a bunch of times, 
and it's never bothered me. But there's always that, okay, is this the one that triggers your immune system? So even though I'm drunk, I'm kind of like, you know, checking my pulse and like, hmm, you know, am I like starting to, because I'm feeling warm. I can feel my foot's like hot. I'm like, oh, you know, <laughs> it's just, am I full of poison? And now I'm going to have a reaction because he bumped me full. And uh, I'm like, you know, what am I going to do? Wake up my friends like, hey, you got to take me to the emergency room. I just got stung by a scorpion. You know, it would take us hours to get out of there and get to the emergency room. And, you know, I don't want to be a pain in the ass. I don't want to die, but I don't want to, you know, ruin the night. So uh, what did I do? I'm like, well, they got me this big bottle of Fireball. So uh, I started hitting it and I took a few good swigs and laid back down. And I'm like, well, you know, the moon goddess is up there. So I'm in her hands. Uh, if I wake up, cool. If I don't, well, my problems are over. And I went to sleep. Needless to say, I woke up. I was fine. Uh, I told my friends what happened. I showed them the video. Now, on my foot, to this day, there is a red dot on my instep where he got me through my shoe with that stinger. So uh, it left like a little mark on my foot. And did whiskey cure it? Well, I don't know. And again, for... Legal reasons, I'm going to say if you get stung, bit, whatever, don't rely on alcohol to save you. But uh, as the cowboys used to say, bottoms up, right? Now, I will add, I have been nailed by almost everything out there except rattlesnakes, thank God. Because there's a saying that everything in the desert bite, scratches, or stings. And there's another little buddy we have out there called the camel spider and here's a camel spider and yes i have been bit by him now i've got a picture of the one that bit me and this is him and you can see he's not looking too good but because that's because he just went through the washing machine because he was in my shirt i couldn't get him out so i just threw my shirt in the washing machine and washed it and after he came out he was a little uh shriveled um now i do have a video about giant camel spider attacks that has another home video of one that ran up my pant leg and got me on the thigh. But if you want to watch it, I'd say watch this video. If not, a toast to everyone that supported the channel and everyone else who's watching. I appreciate all of you, and I will see you later. <laughs>